Is this on, Brother Wes? Galatians chapter 5. Again, just as a kickoff, and remember that we are dealing on probably get done tonight with the subject of the battle with temptation and sin, Galatians chapter 5. And verse 16, we're going to look at quite a few verses tonight, so have your Bibles ready to go, and, and we're going to try to get to uh, some practical things to help you with this battle. But let's start off with Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, where the Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, capital S, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And that's a promise. Shall not. That's a promise. So how do I not fulfill the lust of the flesh? I walk in the Spirit. How do I walk in the Spirit? I let the Holy Spirit control my steps. That's what walking in the Spirit is. Uh, Jesus said the Spirit of God will come to guide you into all truth. Uh, he's our guide. Uh, he shows us the right way. He shows us what's right. He convicts us of sin, what's wrong, of righteousness, what's right, and he convicts us of, and convinces us of judgment, that there's going to be a cost if we don't do right. Amen? And that's his ministry. Now, if we listen to the Holy Spirit, do the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will never lead us to do wrong. Amen. He's God and he can't do wrong. There's no evil in him. So he'll never lead us. So it's the flesh that's leading us to do wrong. That's that sin nature we were born with. And that came about because Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. And then because of that, because uh, Romans 5, 12, wherefore is by, by one man sin entered into the world. Amen. And, 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 and so sin entered in the world by Adam's sin. Now, you can get mad at Adam and Eve, but if they hadn't sinned, that tree, of, that tree of knowledge of good and evil will still be available. And some of us would have taken it, you see. And so God knew that was going to happen. Nothing happens that God didn't know. He knew that was going to happen. And so he just went ahead, and, and he already had a plan made. His plan was he knew man was going to sin, and Christ was crucified before the foundation of the world. Amen. And God has made us people of free choice. We need to understand that. Uh, if free moral agents, we choose. And I've said here in the last couple of lessons that, that, uh, that uh, nobody makes us do anything. We choose. Okay? And God won't slap a beer out of our hand. He won't slap a needle out of our arm. He won't keep us from lying or stealing or anything. He just tells us don't do that. We have to decide whether we're going to walk in the way he guides us or we're going to walk in the way our flesh leads us. The word flesh lust there means to desire or pull. And so the flesh lusts against the spirit. So the flesh pulls us or leads us and the spirit against the flesh. And so the spirit leads us and pulls us. And they're contrary, it says there in verse number uh, four, the, they're contrary the one to the other. They're going to always be contrary. And so we're in this civil war, this struggle. If you're a saved person, you are in a constant battle of civil war. There's this tugging going on. There's the tugging of God that says, do right, do this, don't do that. And then there's the tugging of the flesh, which says, do wrong, go do this. And we're in this constant battle. And so uh, we want to be victorious. We, we know that in Romans chapter 6, we're not supposed to sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. So we know as Christians, we're not supposed to sin. Yeah, that's just common knowledge. Amen. I mean, we all know that. Uh, just, it's just, we don't, we're not supposed to. And if we're a Christian, we have a desire not to sin. That's that spirit. The lost person doesn't have the spirit of God, and so they don't have that same desire to live holy and righteous. Now, they may have morals because they were trained. The Bible says that the law of God is written on our hearts so that we all know there's a right and a wrong. And, and, and that's, that's what God put in the human nature. But our sin nature is the one that pulls us to do wrong. It's just the moral compass of the Bible and of our teaching that keeps people who are not saved on a right track. Amen? But the truth of the matter is they're still sinners. Amen? They're on their way to hell, and they're following the flesh in many areas of their life. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in, and now you're a new creature, the Bible says. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And then it goes on to say, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. That's not saying that we are, we, are, we are sinless, we lost our sin nature. That's saying simply that you're no longer the same. Old things, what you were, have passed away, and everything in your life is now new or different. When you got saved, something happened, amen? I mean, I've had guys say to me, you know, they got saved, and all of a sudden, I mean, everything looked different, everything felt different, their life was different. And it is, when you get saved, that's what happens. 
but you still have the flesh, the sin nature, that's lusting against the spirit. I drop down. We didn't look at these, I don't think, but look at verse number 19 there. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Here's the things that our flesh nature can do. Save flesh, lost flesh, it's all flesh. You, 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 you are not above sinning. and You're not above doing what anybody else does. Amen. And, and you understand that. And uh, that, that'll help you in a couple ways. That'll help you to be cautious. It'll also help you not to be critical. Well, some brother fell. Well, yeah, that happens a lot. David fell. Solomon fell. Amen? And you can go right through the Bible and see some of the greatest people spiritually who fell. Amen? Samson had the power of God on him. And he started messing around with women and ends up losing his, losing his strength, losing his eyes, and grinding at the mill because of lust. That's what happened to him. It blinded him, and, and, it, and, it, and, it, and he, was, he was bound, and he was, and he was beaten by lust. Amen? And uh, Solomon, greatest, wisest man that ever lived. In his old age, he loses God's blessings, and he loses the kingdom because he loved strange women. Well, what's a strange woman? That's a woman you're not married to. He loved many strange women. He had, what, seven, 300 wives and 700 concubines? The guy had a problem, a serious problem. Amen? He was the wisest man that ever lived. You know, if the wisest man that ever lived had that problem and couldn't control himself, you and I, I got a big job ahead of us. Amen? I mean, it's tough. It's a battle. I used to say to my folks, if living Christian's easy, everybody do it. Amen? It's not the easy road. The, the Rice sisters, when I was getting into independent Baptist movement, used to sing that song, it's not an easy road, it's not an easy road. No, it's not an easy road. The Christian life is not the easy road, okay? The Christian life is like, is like going upstream. The stream is coming this way, and you're walking contrary. The Christian life is like being in a crowd of people, and they're all going that direction, but you're going a different direction. And so you're fighting against the pressures and all that peer pressure and uh, the, the pleasure pressure and all of those things. We fight it, amen? The world, the flesh, and the devil are our enemies, and the world is, is, is designed to tempt us. Look at the billboards. Look at the advertisements on TV, Amen. Look the way people behave. Look the way people dress. Look at the opportunities. Look at the bars with the glitzy lights. And look at the music. And look at all that stuff. And you'll see that the world is giving opportunity for the flesh. Amen. Uh, look at the, 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 you know, the party mentality. Go to a college campus and the, the mentality there for a Christian young person to go to a secular university and do right. He better have some character. He better have some convictions. Amen. A couple things you need as a Christian. You need some convictions. What are convictions? Those are firm beliefs of right and wrong. Convictions. And then you need to have some character. What is character? Doing right. I like Bill Rice uh, Sr.'s definition of character. Character is doing right. Uh, character is doing right in spite of internal desire, external pressure, or eventual outcome. Doing right in spite of in, in, internal desire. Even if I don't want to do right, I need to do right. External pressure. Come on. And eventual outcome. If I do right, they may make fun of me. If I do right, I may not get this job. If I do right, I, I, may, I may lose that boyfriend or that girlfriend, but I'm going to do right anyway. That's called character. Amen. And God wants us to have character. The Bible calls it temperance. Temperance, self-control. We'll see it in this passage of Scripture. Works of the flesh, 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, what is the difference? Adultery is a man or woman who is married having a relationship with somebody they're not married to. What is fornication? Fornication is anyone who's not married having a relationship before they're married. You understand that God designed it so that a man and a woman were supposed to marry and then have the relationship, not have the relationship before they're married. Now, I'm not criticizing or condemning. Uh, but, uh, but that's the way God designed it. The only bed that's not defiled is the marriage bed. That's what the Bible says, okay? And so, but, but we have those passions. We all have them. I mean, everybody does. And that's why it goes on. And it gets fed and pumped by the television and the movies and the talk. 
And, you know, now in, in, when I was a kid in high school, you know, it was pretty bad if you did those things. But now it's just accepted. I mean, now they're starting clear down in middle school and, and, be, and, and, and younger. And it's just being fed and pumped through the movies and the television and the music and everything and the talk and, and what's going on. And so, you know, it's a battle. Amen. Uncleanness. That's any type of, that's any type of uh, immorality. Thoughts, pro- thoughts and those kinds of things. Lasciviousness, the same thing. Idolatry. That's worshiping idols. And, uh, you know, we don't do a lot of that here in America. Witchcraft. Seances. You know, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, pharmakeo, the, uh, it is the same. It, it comes from the idea of satanic worship, drugs. Drugs are involved a lot with satanic worship. Music is involved a lot with satanic worship. Amen. You got to be careful about that stuff. Hatred, variance, these are emulations. These are not getting along with people. Wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Amen. You have trouble getting along with people. That's just the, that's the sin nature, amen? I mean, we all have an anger, amen? We all have a temper. Amen, the Bible says, uh, be angry and sin not. It doesn't tell you not to be angry. It says when you're angry, don't sin, amen? Because the truth of the matter is we're going to get angry. We have an anger, but we've got to learn how to, how to not sin when we're angry, amen? And that's tough. And then envyings, we're, we're envious of what people have, and covetousness falls under that, murders, drunkenness revelings, wild party, and the such like, which I tell you before, as also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, you're not saying if you do those as a Christian, you're not going to be saved. But you understand that, that sinners are not going to heaven. God's not going to take us to heaven for sinning. Amen? Yeah, you know, what's God? We're breaking God's law. What's he going to do? Take us to heaven for it? No, when you're breaking God's law like you break the United States, it's a punishment. The punishment for sin is hell. Amen? And so he's pointing out that if you're doing these things, that's not, that's not going to get you to heaven, amen? And people that do those can't expect to go to heaven. Now, watch what he says now in verse number 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, and love working no ill to his neighbor. So if you love somebody, you wouldn't, you wouldn't commit adultery if you loved your wife, your husband. If you love some girl or some boy, you wouldn't take advantage of them, Amen. If you love somebody, you wouldn't steal from them. If you love somebody, you wouldn't sell drugs to them. Amen? If you love somebody, you wouldn't get them drunk. Amen? If you love somebody, you wouldn't tell filthy things to them if you love them. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Temperance. Against such there is no law. That word temperance is a word that you need to get. Temperance simply means self-control. Self-control. Christians are supposed to be under self-control. We're to control ourselves. We're supposed to be in charge of our life. We're not supposed to let other things, other people, or, or events or things control us. We're supposed to be in control. By the grace and help of God, we can be in control. Amen. God will help us, but we have to exercise our will. We have been given a free will. Now, temptation is a fact of life. We already looked at that. And uh, none of us are exempt from it. And so this battle is unavoidable. I mentioned last week we dealt with the consequences of not winning the battle. First of all, this consequence of reaping. You reap what you sow. You know, uh, we like to say this. Young people go out on Friday, sow their wild oats, go to church Sunday, and pray that they have a crop failure. You know, I taught, his, I taught health in the public school, and they taught me to teach humanism, which is tell kids how to have safe sex, tell kids about drugs and alcohol, and God broke my heart and said, well, you're teaching safe sex, you're teaching kids to be fornicators. And so I taught abstinence. Can I tell you this? If you never do that, you'll never get pregnant out of wedlock. If you never do that, you won't get a social disease. You see, there's a consequence for doing that. If you never get drunk, you'll not get a DWI. I was just at my funeral of my high school football coach on Monday, and one of my best friends, we called him Fatty. He was not a drinker, but one night he got convinced by some buddies to go out to a party on the sandbar, and he got drunk, and he tried to jump over the bonfire and landed in it. 
You see, that would have not happened if he hadn't drunk that liquor. Amen. I remember sitting in, uh, in, in band. I played tuba in the band, and one of the guys that was a year older than me came in. He's walking like this, real ginger, and he had these scrapes all over his body and bandages. And I looked at him, and I said to him, I said, hey, well, I, didn't, I, don't know, I won't call his name here. What happened to you? He said, well, I went out to a party at the, at the river, and I got drunk. I climbed up in a tree, and I fell out. You know, if he hadn't got drunk, he wouldn't have climbed up in that tree and fallen out. My grandfather made this statement, a good statement, and you listen to it. He is not wise who learns from his own mistakes. He is wise who learns from the mistakes of others. You know, I, I'm smart enough to figure out that I don't, I don't want to set my hand down and hit it with a hammer. Amen? I watch somebody get drunk and do those things. I say to myself, that doesn't look like something I want to do. Because that seems to me to be a problem, amen? And so there's this matter of wisdom. We need to have wisdom, amen? So there's the, the cost of reaping what you sow. And then there's the cost of God's chastisement. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. You're his child. He ain't going to let you get by with it. I, I used to tell those guys in prison when I preached for them, there's a lot of Christians in prison. You know, the Bible says the companion of fools shall be destroyed. It doesn't say the fool be destroyed. The fool says there is no heart in his heart there is no God. So that crowd that doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in righteousness, they get by with it. That's what David was dealing with in Psalm 73. And he said, as for me, I, 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 I footed well and I slip. Uh, surely God's been good to Israel. As for me, my footed well and I slip. When I consider the prosperity of the wicked. And read it. Go home and read Psalm 73. He says, look, I, I'm doing right and I'm being chastened and, I'm, and, and my, I, I'm under this guilt. And these guys are running around and saying, how does God know? And they're getting by with it. And God took him to the temple and showed him that at their end. They're going to get by with it. One of these days they're going to hell. I don't chasten the devil's children. You understand that? God doesn't chasten the devil's children. He chastens his children. That's why you can't get by with it. That's why I told those guys in prison, you know why you're here and those guys aren't there? Because those guys were lost and you're saved. God ain't going to let you get by with it. Amen. That's the cost of sinning when you're a Christian. Amen. And then there's this matter of a ruined testimony. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. And uh, the testimony. And then there's a matter of doubt. Hereby we, in 1 John 2, 3, we said last week, Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. What gives me peace that I'm a Christian is the fact that I'm doing right. When I don't do right, I begin to wonder about myself. Amen. If I am habitually doing wrong, I'm going to have doubts. We all fail, but if I'm habitually doing I mean, it's just over and over and over and over and over and over and over, and it's a five-year or six-year or ten-year process, and I can't it seems to, then I start doubting what's wrong with me. Amen, and that's part of it. And then there's the loss of our life. We talked about the sin unto death. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I had two of my Christian schoolboys that I buried before they were 30 years of age. Both of them raised in Christian home. Both of them raised in Christian school. Both of them saved, born again. Both of them helped me build the church that we built. And both of them decided to run away from God and from the, what their parents taught them. And both of them decided to go out and live ungodly, wicked lives. And both of them, both of them indicated that God was dealing in their life and they didn't respond like they should have. And they both died. One in a head-on collision. One was burned killed and burned in a gas station because he was messing with the wrong type of people in Las Vegas, Nevada. He went out there to live in Sin City. Well, how's come all those other guys are still living? Those guys aren't because God said, wait a minute, you're my child. I think I mentioned this last week, but I just want to say it to you again. God always starts off gentle. It's a no. Don't do that. And then he has to give us a little slap on the hand. If we don't listen, he has to give us a harder slap on the hand. If we don't listen, he has to give us a harder slap on the hand. Many hard slaps on the hand. And if we don't listen, he takes the belt off. Here's what God does. God doesn't, because he's a father, he pities us. He doesn't, he doesn't zap us the first time we do wrong, just like you do with your children. But if you continue to sin and God doesn't do anything to stop it, what's going to be the result? That's not a loving God. The Bible says if a father loves his child, he chastens him betimes. What does that mean? Early. 
That means he doesn't let him get to the place where he becomes so sinful and, and set in his sin. And we're God's children. He can't let us get to the place where we become like that. That's not a loving father. And so God starts off gentle, and the more you bow your neck, he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck, the Bible says, shall suddenly be destroyed now without remedy. The Bible says, if we devile the body, the temple, that this body shall God destroy. But you're not messing, you don't mess with God. You don't mess with God. He's a loving God. He's more love than he's anything, but don't mess with him, amen? Don't play, don't play with sin and don't play with the Savior, amen? It's serious business to live holy. Serious business to not to, to get away from sin. Now, none of us are perfect. We haven't got there. And so, so the battle makes us feel wretched, too. Now go to Romans chapter 7. We were there last week uh, quite a bit, and we won't be there a lot tonight, but uh, I, I just want you to understand something. If you're truly saved, the battle will make you feel wretched. It really will. If you, if you love the Lord, you're going to feel wretched when you do wrong. It's this thing of guilt. You know, guilt is not something we like, but guilt's a good thing. Guilt is a, is a check and balance on our life. Amen. It's a good thing. A conscience is a great thing. Amen. The Bible talks about searing your conscience. Don't sear your conscience. Don't keep doing things over and over again to the point that your conscience can no longer be affected by it. You know what I'm talking about. You know, that first time you lied to your parents, how your conscience was bothered, but then you kept doing it. Finally, it got where it didn't even bother you anymore. Your conscience is gone. That's serious. Very serious. Look at Romans chapter 7, verse 22. Paul says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing into captivity the law of, my, of sin, which is in my members. Paul was a Christian for 35 years when he wrote this. He said, I want to do right in my heart. I want to do right, but I see this other battle, this thing going on in my mind. Notice that, warring against the law of my mind. Mind, mind. I want to hammer that home, mind. Can I tell you that the only thing the devil can do is plant thoughts? That's all he can do. The only thing the devil can do is, is, uh, is, is, is get you to think about something, desire something in your mind and your heart, and he's trying to get you to make a decision. Where do we make decisions with? Our mind. Our emotions are involved in that, and so he uses the emotions. Uh, what we see, the senses, everything is involved in that. Uh, that, that, that all of that comes into play, and we'll talk about that a little bit here in a minute. Look at verse number uh, 24 and verse 8. O oh, wretched man that I am. Paul said, I'm a wretched man. I, I'm a wretch. He said, I, I, I'm, I'm sick of myself. Uh, uh, you, know, you, may not tonight be, you may not be tonight battling sin real bad, but I got into some serious sin when I was a Christian. The truth of the matter is that I hated myself. I hated myself. I hated what was going on. It, it, was, it, was, it was wretched. It was wicked. It was, it, was, it was filthy. And I didn't want to be that way. But I was. And it was going on. And I needed to get victory. And so uh, I, I've learned some things. Look at verse 24b. He says, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He says, I want to know how to have victory. And that's why I'm teaching this tonight so that we can learn how to have victory, so we can learn there's a battle. Can we learn that it's going to be there constantly all the days of our life? But we can learn how to, how to get victory over it. We can learn how to combat it. And you can get victory. You can get victory, uh, 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 almost 100% victory over everything you're battling with right now. You can get it. You can. By God's grace and hard work, you can get it. And that once you see now, first of all, there's no victory without Jesus. Look at verse 25a. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Where's the deliverance? It's through Christ. Can I tell you that you have strength and you need to use your strength. But the strength that you really need is the strength that God will give you. And that strength will come as the Holy Spirit speaks to your mind and heart. He will never stop you from doing anything or make you do anything, but He will always be there to strengthen you by encouraging you. He's going to always encourage you to do right. He's going to always convict you about wrong. Go to Hebrews chapter 2 with me. Hebrews chapter 2. 
And look at this passage. There's no victory without Jesus. I, and I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not against all these self-help programs, but I just want to say this to you, uh, that without Jesus, there's really no victory. Amen. You know, you can go to N.A. if you want to, and that's okay. And you can go to A.A. if you want to, and that's okay. And they talk about the higher power, and that, you know, it's not, it's not a higher power. It's Jesus Christ. Amen? And, 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 and the principles they have, if they have a principle that's true and right, is in the Bible before they had it. Amen? Like, like D.A.R.E. program. I like the D.A.R.E. program. You know what they teach those young people? Just say no. Well, guess what it says in Proverbs chapter 1? My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. So if somebody offers you a, 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 some sinful, say no. Don't consent to it. That's, you know, they don't have anything the Bible doesn't have. What they leave out is they leave out a born-again experience. When you get Christ in your heart, He's going to work for you. He's going to work in you. He's going to speak to you. He's going to, he's going to make an impact. Amen. All right, you know what I'm talking about? Amen. I mean, man, uh, you didn't have Christ. You got Christ. And sometimes like strange. And I, I've never experienced this before. What is going on? It's God in you. Amen. And praise God for it. He's working. Amen. And then your job is to, co uh, to cooperate with God and be co-laborers in this matter of getting the victory. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Talking about Jesus, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor, that means aid or relieve them that are tempted. So here's what God did. God says, I want to, I want to give you somebody who can help you. So I'm going to send my son. And I'm going to let my son be tempted on this earth by Satan and the world and the people just like you are. And my son is not going to give in to that temptation. And now he's there as a high priest to make, 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 make payment for your sin. But he's also there as a one to succor you or aid and relieve you. So that when you are going through this, you can come to Jesus and he will help you. Go to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 13. T taking this thought a next step, Hebrews 4.13. Neither is there, is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Let me just say this to you. You're not hiding it from God. You know, God sees it. God even knows the thoughts of our mind. God is, even tries the reins of the heart. What are the reins? That's the thing that causes you to turn left or right. God knows why, the decision you made and why you made it. He knows the thought. Hey, you know, whatever you say in speak, secret, the Bible says you'll be shouted from the rooftop. Every work that you've done, you're going to give an account for, whether it's good or bad. I'm not, not hidden anything from God. God knows everything about every thought, every dirty, dirty, dirty thought, every word, every angry thing I did, every time I disobeyed my parents, every time I went in my bedroom, went, meh, 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 meh. You never did that, did you? You never said, my mom and dad, they just they don't want me to have any fun. You never said that stuff. I know you didn't. You never went out and squealed the tires on your daddy's car when he told you not to either, but I did. And God knows all that. He knows it. God knows every time I've looked at a woman that I shouldn't have looked at. He knows it. I'm open and naked before that. He knows every time I had a malicious thought and thought, boy, I tell you, I hope they get theirs. Well, if I, had, if I could right now, I tell you what I'd like to do. I know you don't have those thoughts, amen? You're all perfect, amen? You know, it can open unto, unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Look at number 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, hear that high priest again, that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Don't waver. Don't, don't leave Christianity. You can't leave your salvation, but don't walk away from what God has for you. Don't walk away from the church. Don't walk away from right living. Don't walk away from God's people. Don't go out there and run with the, with the party crowd. Don't run to the bars. Don't run to the honky-tonks. Don't run to those places. Stay in the place where Christians stay, amen? Stay in church. Stay in your Bible. Stay away from sin, amen? we got a wonderful God. Why do you want to run out there with that crowd? He wants to bless you, and they want to, and they want to destroy you. Why do you want to go there? Because you got a flesh nature. Amen. That's why. Amen. 
And then look what it goes on to say in verse 15. For we have not an high priest, talking about Jesus, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was tempted. He was tempted in the wilderness three times, you know, uh, make this bread, these stones into bread because you're hungry. Bow down and worship me and I'll give you everything the world has to offer. Cast yourself down off of this uh, pinnacle and the Father will lift you up. And, and, and he was tempted. And those are the three areas in which we can be tempted. And I'll get to that in a minute. But then the Bible says that, that when he resisted the devil by quoting Scripture, and the devil left him. The Bible says the devil only left him for a season. You think that's the only time Jesus was tempted? Do you understand that if the devil could make Jesus sin, he could destroy the salvation of mankind? Jesus was tempted in all points like we are. The devil was after him 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with both barrels blaring, making, every, making Jesus' life as miserable as he can make it so that Jesus would make a, make a mistake and sin so that salvation could not take place so that everybody could go to hell where the devil's going. Amen. And we have not an high priest that was sin. Look at verse number 16 then. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now it says you've got a high priest, and when you're struggling with sin, he understands you, he, you, you, he is touched by it, he does care, his heart is, 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 is moved by it, and you can come to his throne not, not with a weak, meekness but boldness. Let's come boldly on the throne of grace. We don't have to come apologetically to God and say, God, I'm being tempted. I'm, I'm sorry I'm being tempted. No, we can come to God and say, God, you know I'm being tempted, Christ, and you know I need your help, and he'll give you mercy. What is mercy? Not dealing with you how you deserve. For you may have already messed up and what you're doing. He says, that's all right. I'll be merciful to you, and then I'll give you grace to help. And that grace is a, is a strength or a, a gift of power from God. The grace of God is the strength that God can give us that you and I don't have. I don't have the strength I need to fight certain battles. So I have to come to God and say, God, I want to do right. I want to make the right choice, so you must give me the strength to do it. Amen. You know what? One of your greatest tools for battling sin is prayer. Prayer. Come boldly under the throne of grace. Oh, God in heaven, I need your help. I'm thinking about this right now. By the way, the forgiveness of sin comes from the confession of sin. And can I tell you that you don't need to, you don't need to go tell everybody else in the world what's going on, but hiding it from God isn't going to do anything because God already sees it. So you can come to God boldly and say, God, right now I'm thinking about killing somebody. Help me. Right now I'm thinking about stealing that. God, I, I want that. I, right now I am so jealous because they got to do that. And you hear of jealousy? Man, I mean, if you got any, if you got any gumption in you at all, oh, you're jealous of people that are getting what you don't get and getting to do what you don't get to do. Amen. I mean, I played football, and I wanted to play pro football. I mean, you got any gumption in y'all? Sometimes there's a little jealousy. Why, why couldn't I get to do that? Amen. And you have to recognize it and come boldly to God. God, right now, you, I'm thinking this. You know, He knows what He's thinking. You know, God's look, looking for us to be honest with Him. Be honest with God. Don't play games with God. Don't lie to God. Don't try to hide things from God. Don't try to sleep it under the rug. Look, your mom might not know. Your dad might not know. Your wife may not know. Your husband may not know. Your parents may not know. I mean, your, uh, your children may not know. The brothers and sisters may not know. But God knows. And because God knows, He loves you. He wants you to be victorious. So He says, come boldly to me and let's talk this thing out and let me give you the grace that you need to win it. Listen, I tell you what, I am, I am, I am uh, painfully honest and blunt with God. I don't try to hide anything from God. 
When I am battling, I try to be honest with him. And when I have sinned against God, I tell him bluntly, God, this is exactly what I did. You already know it. And, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm confessing it. I'm asking you to forgive me. Thank God for 1 John 1, 9. Amen. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sin. Confess doesn't mean to say I'm sorry. Confess, confess means to admit to what you did. You say I'm sorry. You expect forgiveness. You don't get it. You get forgiveness and cleansing when you be honest with God. Say, God, I said, God, I thought. God says, you've been honest. I'll forgive you. I'll cleanse you of it. See, let's just be honest. We are masters at playing games. We are masters at deception. We are masters of trying to make ourselves look better than we are and trying to hide the real us from everybody, including God. Now, can I say this? I, I don't think that you ought to go around airing your dirty laundry to the brethren. Amen? Nobody in the world needs to know my sin. Amen? I remember Dr. Hiles was with Dr. Rice, and they were preaching one place, and Dr. Hiles went to Dr. Rice's room, and he got there a little bit early, and he knocked on the door, and Dr. Rice said, come in. And just as he came in, Dr. Rice had folded up a piece of paper and dropped it in the uh, toilet and was flushing it. And Dr. Hiles, just out of curiosity, said, hey, Doc, what was that? He said, that was a list of my sins. And he said, I flushed it. I don't want anybody to know him but God. But before Dr. Rice would go preach, he got down on his knees and said, God, I need to make sure I don't have any sin in my life. And so, God, I'm going to write down the things I know, and you show me the things that I haven't, I haven't acknowledged. And I want to acknowledge to you these sins so that you can forgive me so that I can be used of you. See, he that covereth his sin, the Bible says, shall not prosper. But he that forsaketh it and confesseth it shall find mercy. Don't play games with God. He already knows. If right now while I'm preaching, and by the way, can I tell you, I can have sinful things happen while I'm preaching. I remember Brother Barton, when I was in second, he got up one day and he says, he said, I, I, folks, you'd be amazed the kind of things that the devil runs through my mind when I'm sitting on the platform. Well, of course, because he's trying to destroy the service. Because he's trying to ruin a man of God. He's trying to ruin a church, amen. And so he's going to attack, amen. We have an adversary. The devil's a roaring lion walking about seeking. Who may, he's trying to attack you. He's trying to destroy you. He's trying to destroy your family. And he don't play fair. He has no rules. He has no morals. He has no, he has no conscience. He doesn't play fair. Let me tell you something else about the devil. He's had 6,000 years of practice. I've been saved 55 years. That's a long time to be saved. Now, I ought to be a better Christian than a lot of other people. But 55 years compared to 6,000 years is not a very fair, a very, very fair fight. Amen? And I mean, he is, uh, he, is, uh, he is more subtle than any of the beasts. The Bible, Paul said, I'm jealous over you, lest as his, uh, through the, uh, his dis subtly he deceived Eve, he'll also deceive you. He is slick. He's a master at trickery. He's the wiles of the devil. He can make bad look right. He can make ungodliness look good. He can convince you that you take that fruit, it'll make you wise. He can convince you that God didn't say what God said he, he said. Amen. And so you and I have got to be ready to fight this battle. But thank God we have Jesus. And without Christ, there will be no victory. But with Christ, you can have victory. And we need to understand the method. So go back to Romans chapter 7, verse 25. Romans chapter 7 and verse 25. We need to understand the method. Now, I sure hope you'll get this. I sure hope that I'll be able to help you here tonight. It's a matter of getting control of your mind. It's a matter of getting control of the passions. The mind and the heart, I believe, are synonymous. Okay? I don't believe that this is the heart. I believe that your being, your central being, and you think with your mind, I, I don't, you know, is, is it this gray matter up here? It's that part that God put in us that makes us human. And it works together, in mind and emotions. It all works together. You know, we think and we feel. Amen? 
And that's how the devil attempts it, attacks us. He couldn't attack us if we didn't think, and he couldn't attack us if we didn't have feelings. Amen? And so he uses your heart and your mind to try to get you to do things. He gives you desires in your heart and gives emotions in your heart, and he gives you thoughts in your mind, and all of these things are tools that he's using to get you to do something. It's called temptation, okay? And that's how he does it. So look at Romans chapter 7, verse 25, and part B at the end there. It says, so then, Paul said, who shall deliver me? Then he said, so then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Paul learned something. He said, now, if I let my flesh, my passions, and my fleshly thinking control me, I'm going to sin. But if I'll use my mind that God gave me, use my mind. Now, I always ask people, you know, you got this little statement, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Pretty good question to ask yourself. If Jesus was being uh, encouraged to do this right now, what would he do? If Jesus was facing this decision, this, this battle, this choice right now, what would he do? Or what, would the, what does the Bible say I should do? You know why it's so important to get in the Bible? Because the Bible is our guidebook to what's right and wrong. And the Bible tells us what we should do and what we shouldn't do. It, it, it is our moral, it's, a moral, it's a moral compass or standard. You know, I know when somebody brings over some liquor and offers it to me that my Bible told me I'm not supposed to look on the wine when it's red, when it moves itself aright. I've done enough studying to know the Bible says when the, when the grape juice is fermented and is bubbling, you don't look at it. Don't look at it. Don't even look at it. I'm not a drunk. You know I'm not a drunk? I never drank. Pretty simple. You don't drink, you won't become a drunk. Well, not everybody who drinks becomes a drunk. You know, but how do you become a drunk? You become a drunk by drinking. Now, if you never drank, you wouldn't be a drunk. Amen. I'm not hooked on cigarettes because I didn't smoke cigarettes. Yeah, you, not everybody smokes cigarettes gets hooked on them. Well, most people do. But if you never smoke a cigarette, you won't get hooked on a cigarette. I'm not belittling anybody. I'm simply telling you that's the way you got to look at it. This, I know, is, is not what God wants me to do. And so I'm going to use my mind instead of my passions. I'm not going to let my passion, oh, man, I want it, I want it, I want it. No, I'm not doing it. No. N-O. No, you know, I used to tell my kids when I was raising them, Sister Brenda, I used to tell them, what part of no don't you understand, the N or the O? No is no. Have no fellowship with the real fruit of God. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not. You know, by the way, he's telling you. No, he's not telling I'm going to not let you steal. He said you shouldn't do it. No, no stealing. No adultery. No lying. No, no. It's the mind. Are you, are you with me tonight? Amen? Are you with me? It's the mind. It's the mind. It's the mind. It's getting under control. It's that word temperance, self-control. I want to go over here right now and kick that wall. But I'm going to control myself, and I'm not going to kick that wall because that would be an inappropriate behavior. Amen? Now, God is going to help me. God is going to encourage me. You know what? And God's going to try to keep me from doing that. And when I do right, you know what God's going to do? He's going he's to he's give me some kind of a reward, some kind of a blessing, some kind of a praise for that. He's going to give me a good feeling. When I'm facing this bad decision and I make the right decision, that feels good. And when I make the wrong decision, that feels bad. And that, you know, that, that's good. That's, that we need to pay attention to that. Well, listen. The devil can only tempt you with a thought or a suggestion. He can only do that. We, the temptation of Jesus, you go home and read it, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. But Jesus was hungry, so he suggested, why don't you turn that stone into bread? Would it have been wrong for Jesus to turn stone into bread? No, but who was trying to get him to do it? It's not necessarily what you're doing is wrong. It may be what's the motive for doing it. And then, uh, and then he said to Jesus, he said, look, yeah, he took him up on a high mountain. He showed him everything in the world. He said, now, if you'll just bow down and worship me, I will, I will give, you the, uh, give you all this, th these things. And Jesus said, it's written, thou shalt worship the Lord of God, and him only shalt thou serve. 
See, Jesus knew that he wasn't supposed to bow down and worship Satan. He's supposed to worship the Father. Satan wasn't supposed to be telling him what to do. God's supposed to be telling him what to do. And so he said, I'm not doing it. And then he took him up on a pinnacle of the temple. He said, cast yourself down. And the father said that if you stumble and you, stu uh, you stub your toe, he'll not let you fall. He'll catch you. And Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord. Now, there are three areas here. There's the, pride, there's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the only three areas that Satan can tempt us. What is the lust of the flesh? Hunger, drunkenness, addictions, sexuality, anything that, that feeds the flesh, makes the flesh, the physical part of you, have some type of enjoyment or some type of pleasure, some type of a high or some type of addiction, that's the lust of the flesh. You're hungry, go eat. Not wrong to eat. But how are you eating? Are you gluttony? It's not wrong to have a sexual relationship, but how are you having it? You're having it inside of marriage, it's okay. Anywhere else it's not. Amen? Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, that's covetousness. That's I want, I want, I want, I want. Look here, you can have the world. You can have everything. I mean, how many people don't come to church because they're out getting things? How many people don't pay their tithes and offerings because they're out spending their money on stuff they want? How many people do all kinds of things to get? Get lie, steal, cheat, stealing, all those types of things? To get lust of the eyes. Pride of life. What's pride of life? Self-exaltation. When the devil said, Jesus, cast yourself down, you know what he's saying? Show everybody your God. Lift yourself up, Jesus. You know, that's what bragging is. Hey, look at me. That's what these national football players do. It makes me sick. Those pro basketball players. God says he hates pride. He loves humility. And when you stop and think about it, every time you're tempted with something, every time you, something wrong comes along, you can place it in one of those three areas. This is either just a passion of my flesh and desires, or this is me wanting something in a wicked way, or this is me trying to exalt myself, make myself look better, lift myself up. And that's the way he tempts us. That's the areas he tempts us. Now, the Bible says that we fight this with the mind. We fight it with the mind. I'll not have time to finish this tonight because we're running out of time. But I want you to write down 1 John 2, 15 through 16. And you'll find there those three terms, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And you'll find that they are not of the Father, but they're of the world. I want to say the devil cannot and does not make you do anything. And so we understand that. Win the battle by recognizing temptation. Let I me mean, just get this. You, you must recognize temptation. I think one of, the, one of the, the craziest things that we do in our life is we go through life unaware of what's going on in our life. The Bible says a wise man is aware. He considers danger. He, he's always aware. He's always looking. A lot of times we don't even think about what's going on in our head. A lot of times we got stuff going on inside of us and we don't know. One of the things I had to learn is I had to start paying attention to what was going on here. What am I thinking? What am I feeling? What's happening inside of me? Where is this coming from? Why am I doing it? I had to become aware. I have be, I'm very aware. I'm, listen, I'm aware of every thought I have. I have trained myself to be aware of what I'm thinking. Because can I say to you, if you think it, you could be the same as doing it, or it certainly is putting you in danger of doing it. See, if a man looks on a woman to lust, so he sees a woman, and then his thoughts begin to become improper, and now he's committed adultery with her. She's beautiful. 
Is that sinful? I don't know. It's getting on the edge. She's not my wife. Should I be thinking those thoughts about her? I'm not saying I sinned because I saw her as beautiful, but I tell you it's a small little step from beautiful to thinking something you shouldn't think. Seeing. That'll be watching what's going on with your eyeballs. You'll be watching what's going on with your, with your desires. You know, all men like cars, amen. Any men here don't like cars? All men like cars. You know what? I, I have, I've had to quit looking at cars. Is it wrong to look at a car? Not wrong to look at a car, but it's wrong to look at a car and start coveting after it. I don't go to the new, new car lot and drive around. You want to know why? I'll start wanting one of them, and I'll end up buying one of them. I don't have the money, so I'll go in debt to get it, and that's a real bad sin, Amen. Amen. I put myself in financial mess as I got to have that car. I, I love guns. I don't go by the gun shop very often. Once in a while, just once in a while, I go by and I look. I don't stay very long because I don't want something to start stirring. You know, ladies, be careful going shopping. It's okay to go shopping. If you got the money to spend, go spend it. But I know some guys that are struggling real bad trying to keep their bills paid because their wives are spenders. And they, kiss, they just can't keep ahead and they're in a mess because they can't get their wife to buy. Look, you know what? Most of us got more clothes in our closet than we'll ever wear. Why do we need some more? I want it! Is that lust? Was well, it wrong to have nice things? No, I didn't say that. I said you need to be aware of what's going on in your heart, in your mind, your eyes, your thoughts, your, 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 your desires. You need to be aware of that. You need to understand. We need to see temptation. How are you going to battle something if you don't know it's there? So we're aware of it. But don't get beat up that the temptation makes you a sinner. Recognize it so that you can then be prepared to do battle. How do we do battle? I've got to do this before we leave because if I don't, I'm going to leave some folks in some real frustration here. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 with me, and I'll give you this, and we'll close tonight, and I'll have one more Wednesday night on this. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. And look with me, if you would, please, in verse number 3. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3. Are you there? When you get there, say amen. All right, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3. Paul says to the Corinthians, by the way, the Corinthian, Corinthian church was the most carnal church in the world. What does that mean? That means they had so much sin in the church. He said you come behind in no gifts, and then he said all the sin. Here's the sins you have. In 2 Corinthians, you rise to him, and he says, look at verse 3. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, in other words, I am living in a fleshly body, we do not war after the flesh. He says, I am not trying to fulfill the deeds of the flesh. I'm not warring after that. Also, I'm not warring in a fleshly manner. Look what he says in verse number 4. For the weapons of our warfare, weapons of our warfare, the spiritual battle, the weapons of our warfare, that's a word I can't, I want to know what weapon to use, the weapons of our warfare, are not carnal. They're not fleshly. You can't use everybody else's method, but mighty through God, God, with His warfare, if you use His weapons, it'll be mighty and through God, and it'll pull down to the pulling down of the strongholds. What is a drug addiction? It's a stronghold. What is alcoholism? It's a stronghold. What is pornography? It's a stronghold. What is lying? It's a stronghold. Anything you're doing habitually is a stronghold. I need to pull those out of my life, don't I? I, mean, I need to have victory. Pulling down strongholds. Verse 5 now, look what he says. Casting down imaginations. Anything that you're imagining. Ah, imagine what it'd be like to have that car. Imagine what it'd be like to have that house. Imagine what it'd be like to have him. Imagine what it'd be like to have her. 
Oh, I can just taste a good cold one right now. You know what people are doing? They're talking about what they're thinking about, what they're imagining. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Any philosophy, any statement, any teaching, any suggestion that's against this book, you've got to cast it down. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. How do we revenge or how do we take revenge on disobedience or sin? We take revenge on it by doing good right. Sin, you're trying to get me to do wrong, but I'm going to take revenge on you. I'm going to do right. Ha, ha, ha. How do I do that? Casting down imaginations. Every high thing that's all self against God. And bringing in captivity every thought to Jesus. See, the devil said to Jesus, make this stone bread. He said, nope, I'm not taking that thought. The Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone. I'm not going to think what you suggested. I'm going to think what the Bible says. You said, bow down and worship you, but the Bible says, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. I'm not going to accept your suggestion. I'm not going to accept your, your, your imagination. I'm not going to accept this exalts itself against God's word. I'm going to be obedient. And he brought revenge upon the disobedience. I'm not going to cast myself down here because the Bible says uh, that we should not tempt God. Now, you're, you're trying to get me to, to, to do something that would force God to do something that he shouldn't do. So, and he said, I'm not going to do it. Okay, now, here's what you have to learn to do. You have to learn to recognize what's going on up here. What's going on here? And when you see that it's a wrong thought, it's a wrong emotion, you've got to take that thing, you've got to rip it from your mind, and you've got to cast it down. And then you have to bring in your, into captivity your thinking to the knowledge of Christ. I call it mental gymnastics. Okay? I'm thinking here. I got stinking thinking. I now have to make myself think properly. How did Jesus do it? By quoting Scripture. That's, that's one of the main ways you do it. By saying, no, God says. And now I'm thinking about what God says instead of what the flesh is saying and the devil is saying. And now I have the opportunity then to do what God wants me to do, thereby being victorious. But if I let that thought stay there and it keeps running around in my mind, you know what's going to eventually going to happen? It's eventually going to overtake me. Man, I gotta have it. I gotta have a drink. 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 The moment it said I gotta have a drink, you know what I should have said? Nope. Drunkenness. That's a sin. Can I tell you this though? And I'll close. It's not gonna be as easy as I just made it sound there. It's a hard battle. You may have to take that thought 10,000 times in an hour and cast it down before you actually finally get your mind to quit racing that way. The mind is, a, is an amazing thing, but I don't know about yours. My mind is a racing mind. My mind is a rolling mind. When something starts, it gets in there, and I have a hard time getting it out. I'm ADHD. I'm telling you that mind is going and it just keeps going, and sometimes, literally, I almost scream, Stop! Stop! I don't want to think that! You know what? People think I'm crazy what they want to. But I don't care if it takes me three hours. I'm going to battle it until I get it won. I'll tell you a story, and I'll close. I used to listen to the wrong kind of music. And when I, when I first went to Jefferson City, Walmart played all this music. I guess they still play it, but I don't hear it, praise the Lord. And I knew the songs. I knew the words. And I knew there were songs that I shouldn't be listening to and, and thoughts I shouldn't have in my head. And I'd be going down the aisle, and these, thought, these songs would be going on, and these thoughts would be going in my head, 
And, and I said, God, I don't want this. And you know what I did? I knelt down behind my, my cart in Walmart, knelt down on my knees behind my cart in Walmart. I said, dear God, you know what I'm thinking. And God, I don't want this going on. My God, please help me. You knelt behind your cart in Walmart? I sure did. Didn't you think somebody think you're crazy? I didn't care. You see, I ain't worried about what people think. I'm worried about getting the victory. Can I tell you that you're going to have to really want it really bad and you're going to have to really fight really hard if you want to truly get victory. God will help you. But you're going to have to use the weapons of the warfare. You're going to have to see that. You're going to have to start fighting. You're going to have to start dealing with it. You're going to have to start taking your sword and cutting off the head. Amen. You're going to have to start using that shield and warding off those arrows. You're going to have to start getting in your prayer closet and praying down the power of God. And I promise you, if you do that and you keep working at it, keep working at it, keep working at it, you'll get the victory. It's like weightlifting. It's hard when you start, but if you'll keep going, you'll build muscles, you'll get strength, and one of these days, that 150 pounds that you couldn't hardly lift off your chest will be like a little, like a little toothpick. <laughs> Satan, you can't do it. You can't hit me with that anymore. Get out of here. Huh. I don't even think those things anymore. You have to find somebody else to bother with that. Amen. I know that you can get to that place in the battle with temptation and sin. Father, we love you. Thank you for the